Hi, I'm Maria Thea harris Vella Serves on Social Media. Welcome back to Sir Over 50 Podcast on So Organised Style. Grab a cuppa and relax with us. So Organised Style Podcast acknowledges traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and to the Elders past, present and emerging. Thanks for joining us on a special So Over 50 podcast. So Over 50 intersects with all communities. Thanks for coming back to hear about Angie's actual TV experience in more detail. If you haven't listened to part one of Angie's podcast, please go back and have a listen to it so you don't feel like you missed out on anything that she talked about in the first podcast. In this podcast, you'll hear about some of the really lovely things that Angie is planning to do this year that I know that you'll support her with. What was the show? Because I don't live in the UK. Yeah, and it's a shame. I don't think you can get it either, can you? It's on a channel called More 4. That's mm-hmm. the app. The app is More 4, and it's Channel 4 here in England. The program is called Kirsty's Handmade Christmas. Kirsty Alsop is, she'll be well known to people here, and she does a program called Location, 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 where she and her co host help people find a new property. And she is a crafter and she's been doing craft shows, I'd say, for the last 10 years or so. And the Handmade Christmas Show, it's a series of competitions mixed in with the judges of the competition showing Kirsty how to do crafty things at Christmas. And there are 10 competitions. There's one each episode. So there are 10 episodes in the fortnight sort of around Christmas. I think this time it was a week before running up. In fact, originally, I think mine was meant to be on Christmas Eve. So you've got 10 competitions and they're the best of whatever, best Christmas tree decorate, best gingerbread house, best toy, which was the one that I did. Originally, the producer who contacted me said, we'd like you to do a a Christmas stocking. And I thought about it and I just thought, I don't know what I could do to make it that interesting because they want you to have something unusual about it. And we had this conversation trying to think of it. So there was a stocking. There's a best Christmas jumper. They're filmed over half a day. So when the day that we were there, it was in the afternoon and there was another competition in the morning. And I think the gingerbread house one is an all day one because of the baking and the planning. It's just 10 days of making. Ours was the best handmade toy. The toy that won was a wooden spinning top and it was in the shape of the Christmas tree. So because he was working with equipment that was noisy, he was in a separate room in a workshop. The other three of us were in this lovely sort of Santa's grotto making our toys. Mm -hmm. So he had this spinning top, which was a Christmas tree. Going around the bottom of the tree was a train. So that was carved into it. And then hanging from the tree were baubles on rope, tiny, tiny. I mean, they were probably half an inch, if not smaller. Wow. So you are allowed to do one thing at home. So he made his baubles because there were dozens of them and you couldn't make those. So he made, but when you... When you pull the top and it started to spin, the balls just spin around like the solar system. It was just amazing. It was magical. And he had to win. It was so fantastic. The young girl, Sophie, made a toy. In America, we call it checkers. In Britain, they call it drafts. I don't know what they call it. Is it drafts? I think it's drafts. Yeah. Drafts in Australia. So she made a drafts board and she, she works in polymer clay. She made the pieces to look like macaroons. So Ooh. they're beautiful, really, really adult, just lovely. And as I say, and then Heather made this wooden balsa wood jewelry box with Christmas carols inside it. And we all had mistakes. We all had accidents, which is quite funny. <laughs> and none of them were on show, which is great. So my accident, I'm sewing away. Well, there were two things. Uh, so I made this black doll, this rag doll. She was a black doll with hair that kind of the, the wool naturally looked like braids, which was quite nice. And it was just the nature of the wool. So that was very good. And she had wings, these padded wings, like the wings that I make that are on my Instagram page, which were appliqued and then quilted. And then she had a ruffle dress, which was a base of cream fabric with layers and layers of gathered lace on it. So it was this frilly dress with a red waistband ribbon. And then she had little glittery shoes, which were meant to have glittery elastic laces, but I ran out of time. On her head, she had a tiara, which was, again, a red elastic waistband with felt flowers. And it was, it was so you could take the waistband off and, and her face was embroidered. 
you know, I had my list because I'm, I'm a list maker. And so I had this list I made, you know, my spreadsheet of all the things that I needed to do in the exact order I needed to do them. First mistake. And I knew I would do this. I, even though I told myself I swapped the order. I thought, no, no, no. I'm going to do the hardest thing first because otherwise I'll be worried. Oh, that was the thing. I left my list at home. Oh, so no. luckily, yeah, like you do. So luckily on the phone, I sent the Excel file to the woman at the hotel. Thank you. You're a star. I love you. And she printed it for me. Thank the Lord. It was just so anyway. So I had this list and I decided I'm going to make the wings first because they're quite complicated. I want to get it right. It's a machine I've never used. Luckily, it was genome and we have them in the sewing school. So I had practice, you know, I threaded up the machine, put the bobbin, I had pre-wound bobbins, sewed the thing and I hadn't turned it around. I just sewed it together and put the foam stabilizer in, sat it to one side. And then I thought, oh yeah, this is going fine. It's good. I'm okay. I'm going to now sew whatever I was going to sew. And I thought, I need to change thread and I'll just do a test to make sure everything's fine. So (laughs) I got this little piece of fabric. I sewed a couple of stitches, lines, turned it over and there was no tension at all nothing just straight lines and I thought you've worn that bobbin in incorrectly so I go and I pick up these discreetly because there are photographers that you know the film is everywhere pick it up and look at the back and I'm thinking oh for goodness sake they're nothing so he'd already filmed me Mark because each everybody has their own filmer you know cinematographer and so I, I thought it's okay I'm just going to put the other thread back in the machine. I'm just going to pick it up and go again. And he said to me, I'm, oh, why are you doing that? And I said, well, the thing is, it's this is a toy. It's going to be played with. So I thought I'd reinforce my stitches to make sure it's super strong. <laughs> nice work. And I just thought, oh, you know, he doesn't know. He's just going to buy whatever I say. That's, so that was fine. And then I got onto the face. So I'm pre-drawn the face onto the fabric. Mm-hmm. So I was embroidering the face and then managed to sew my finger to the fabric in the embroidery hoop. So I was like, I'll just put this under the table and I'll just pull the needle out. Oh, good. No blood. OK, put that there. I'll get the tissue. It's fine. Again, fine. Nobody will notice. It's fine. They were my mistakes. It's just hilarious. And then Heather, uh, who was using, you know, a, a glue gun for the bits, glued her fingers together. But oh. luckily, nobody noticed. And she had whatever you use to unglue. So I'll just get that. I'll just unglue them. That's fine. At the very end, Sophie, her kiln caught fire and there was smoke coming out. But luckily, it was right at the end. We heard the next day that from the chap who was doing the spinning top, he was, you know, working quite quickly and everything's going fine. And, you know, because he's used to being in his own workshop. He thought, I'm just reaching over here, not really looking to pick up what he thought was a straw. And it was a scalpel, nearly mm-hmm. chopped his finger off, mm. right? So he sort of said, oh, I think I might need a plaster. So there's just him and his filmer in the room. Mm-hmm. And he kept saying this, and the guy's not reacting. And then he pulls up his finger and puts it in his face, and there's blood just pouring. And he goes, oh, right. And it's because, like you, he had headphones on, mm-hmm. and he's just listening to the director, yeah. giving him instructions. So he couldn't hear <laughs> so when he came out when we all came up the judging he had this great big blue plaster on his finger and I said oh what's that he said oh I nearly cut my finger off it's fine so we all had these accidents which was just great none of which was shown so that was really really good but interestingly enough Kirsty, who I've seen before I've gone to one of her craft fairs years ago she's very confident she's she's a, a show woman she can hold a crowd she was really nervous and she fluffed her lines as I'm sure people do but she does this thing when she fluffs her line. She goes into the corner of the room and faces the wall. And then somebody else comes in and just tells a joke and she's there. And literally her nose was almost pressing the wall and just, and she gets herself back together and she comes back and she carries on. And it was just amazing. It was like, gosh, how do you do that? And then if, if ever anybody swore, the whole group would start singing la, 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 to remind the editor to edit that bit out. It was brilliant. Really, really interesting. But it's interesting to see people work that you've seen for years on telly who looks super confident and she was but not always so that, that was quite interesting but yeah so Kirsty's handmade Christmas every year at Christmas and the, our judge was a toy maker himself he makes wooden interactive educational toys I think almost like puzzles and things quite a, quite a niche but yeah so that was ours. Is making toys something that you have done before? 
Yes, only for my children and my niece, Lysia. In fact, originally I was going to give her the doll that I made, but I've decided to keep her because she's quite special. Sorry, Lys. Yes, it is. And I've thought about it and I've toyed with the idea. Funny enough, I was talking to Kirsty, the, the host, and she was saying she struggled to buy black dolls for her niece. Her, her sister-in-law is black. And she said she had to send off to America to get, I think it was Baby Annabelle was the doll of the year, this is 20 odd years ago, to get a black one because there just weren't many. And in fact, when I did my research, going into toy shops in England, there was just a couple and they were just pink dolls painted black, you know, no hint of ethnicity. And I thought, I would really love to do this. I'd love to, but if, if I were to do it, I'd like to do it one-offs, you know, bespoke to order. So there's a company in America I think they're called Harper and Mon, and they're a mother and daughter duo. And they make dolls in every shade of brown you can imagine. Just beautiful. They were to order or you could buy. She has a range of dolls and then you choose the colour. Often people who buy them from them, buy them because they want them to look like their daughter. And I thought, what a lovely, lovely idea. Yeah. But I mean, I've made Lysia dolls and I made my girls rag dolls. And when they asked you for a backstory, and this is, you know, about dolls. And I said, well, this actually goes back to my daughter coming home from school when she was six and it was Christmas and we have the Christmas play. And she said, I'm going to be Barbie in the Christmas play. And I'm like, oh, okay, because it's Santa's grotto. And I says, oh, well, how am I going to make you Barbie? And she said, oh, mummy, it's easy. It's easy. You just buy me the life-size Barbie in the toy shop and I'll wear her dress. <laughs> and I thought, no, I'm not doing that. But in the end, I made her a bridesmaid's dress in Barbie pink. It was just the most hideous pink you've ever seen, but she loved it. And a friend, a male friend, had gone as Lady Godiva the previous year for a fancy dress party. So I had this flawless blonde wig. She was actually the narrator of the Christmas concert. She, she was the host. When she walked into the stage, people were crying because it was just so amazing, her in this long wig. And I remember when I took the wig into school, the kids in the class went, oh, you really are Barbie. Look at her, she's Barbie. It's just, you know. And I, I said this and they said, oh, have you got a picture of, of that for the show? And I asked Kate for her permission. She said, oh, yes, if you must, mum, yeah, you can give it to them. So when they do my little backstory, the first thing they zoom in on full screen is this picture of Kate as Barbie. And she looked at me and said, oh, thanks, mum. I appreciate that. <laughs> but yeah, so but I do love that idea of making dolls that look like their owners, that look like the children who own them. I'm toying with that idea. I've started making patterns for the shop where I work. I've just made a children's apron, a reversible, no waste fat quarter apron that they can wear. And I thought it would be nice to have maybe a workshop where we made dolls, a bit like the mummy and child yeah. workshop that went. I love that idea. I love dolls and, and my girls did. We've put out a podcast about the Utando Project. So if you mm -hmm. go to utandoproject.org. Okay. Yeah. There should be some patterns there. The design of the dolls reflects the child's appearance and culture. They make dolls in Australia to send to KwaZulu-Natal oh, wow. in South Africa. Wow. And they're given to disadvantaged and vulnerable children. People who work with them use those dolls to help them understand what's happening around them through play. Wow. Or they're going into a hospital and so some of the toys are actually made to look like doctors and nurses and medical staff wow how interesting that's really good Do you know, wow. I can see how useful that would be I remember my daughter Kate who I've just been talking about she had childhood asthma or infantile asthma as they call it and she was having been in hospital she was terrified after that of doctors and nurses yeah. and something like that would have been so useful for her to play with particularly in the run-up to going in and what a great project I like that really good I'll look at it Okay. Very All good. right. Thank you. You're Just welcome. Another thing for me to sew. Great. But yes. Yes. I, I hope to make some more. I'm, I'm, I make a lot of things for my niece and nephew or my, my great niece and nephew, I think. Mm -hmm. I started to make a quilt and some other things for Christmas presents and it didn't happen. You know, you sort of overstretch yourself. I had all these great plans of all these things. I made most of them, but these were two big things. And see, Charles going to listen to this, but it's okay. But she'll hear it and she'll be excited. I found this quilt pattern and there's a link to it on my Instagram feed. And it looks like intersecting stripes. But in actual fact, I've made it as a playmat. Somebody who worked for the designer had done this with, because it wasn't meant to be a playmat. So I've used green fabric and then two shades of grey. So the green is, is the grass and it's a Christmassy fabric. 
And these two shades of grey are the roads. And then she's included felt templates for cars. Oh. Yeah, so I've got a Cricut cutter. I've cut out these multicoloured cars, so I'm going to applique those onto the quilt. And then I've bought a set of wooden, brightly coloured cars to go with it. That's your present, Jesse. if you're listening. <laughs> so that's ongoing. And then for Liz, because Jesse, for his birthday, I made him a book cushion. And it was an alphabet book cushion. And inside the cushion was an alphabet book mm-hmm. that I'd quilted. So I thought, well, I'll do one for Liz. So I've done Liz here, a book cushion. It's the Lola Dutch fabric. Lola Dutch, they're books. Yep. And so I've put the Lola Dutch book in it. And then I'm going to make the doll, the Lola Dutch doll. And she wears a pink tutu. And she's got a red cardigan on with a big red bow. So I thought I would make a doll with these things. So those are the two projects I'm working on. I've not been working on at the moment because I've been working and we were short staffed. So I've been doing extra hours. We've now filled that position. Yay, hi, Kate. So I've got my Mondays or Sundays to Wednesday free now to sew. Those are the two things. Those and the Mrs. Maisel dress, the couture dress. Oh. That's quite a big project. I'm a huge fan of Mrs. Maisel. Watched it several times over, looking forward to the new series. Yes, it's a very funny series, but the clothes are amazing. I sit there every week thinking, how can I make that? How can I make that? (laughs) And there's one dress. It's set in the 50s, but she just wears these amazing clothes. And in the second episode, her mum is trying to get her to get the husband back. So she says, put your red dress on, that will do it. And she wears, again, on my feed, she Mm -hmm. wears this red dress, which is just the most beautiful dress I have ever seen in my life. I've seen several people try to hack it and make it, and it wasn't quite right. And I thought, I need this dress. And it's got a big white puffy petticoat. The, I, I can't remember if they're called the Couture Coalition. It's a coalition for sewers in New York, and they design, if not all the costumes, on Mrs. Maisel. And the designer of that particular dress donated the pattern to a fund to help sewers who've been financially burdened because of COVID. So all the profits go to them. So it's this beautiful red 50 sort of bowl gown or tea dress, depending on how you make mm-hmm. it. And I bought this from Etsy, and it, it's a traditional couture pattern so you get the couture instructions as well as a video an hour-long video of how to make it wow it's a beautiful silk fail I don't know if that's how you put it, pronounce it f-a-i-l-l-e yep and it's that textured silk it's got body to it so it's that and then it's interlined and then it's lined. although the bodice isn't lined I always line mine mm-hmm. and it's very fitted so I thought oh I'll look up the silk fail I'll get some of that for this dress cheap as I could find was 75 pounds a meter this dress needs five meters whereas mostly it cost 150 pounds per 150 pounds just and I thought no I'm not making that I'll have to think of something else so I bought some beautiful crepe back satin which I love really heavy lovely medium weight beautiful red and I made another dress in it I've made in fact that was my last project and it's a yep. wrap dress that I've made it's before beautiful and it's, I oh, thank you. I love it, but it's not the right fabric for this dress. So, mm-hmm. but I'm really pleased with that dress. Yeah. So I kept look, looking and I found a, I think they're called milk meat. You might know because they, they sell this fabric in Minerva and it's a tensile fabric. Mm-hmm. Apparently tensile's wood pulp, which I found really fascinating. And it's a twill, but it's a fluid twill. So it's not as stiff as say a cotton twill, but it's just the right thickness and get it's red. I have a lot of red dresses now. I'm just thinking about that. <laughs> I, need to, I need to find another colour. But it so has to be I, the right colour red, though. It has to be the right colour red. This is it. It has to be. I've had that many swatches. And this was just perfect. Absolutely perfect. It's similar to the fail because it's the fail is almost ribbed, isn't it, the silk? It's almost mm-hmm. a ribbed texture. It is a twill, but just, just beautiful. So that's the outer fabric. Then I'm going to line it with cotton so it breathes. Yep. And then I'm going to interline the bodice with silk or glanza. Yep, so it good. keeps its shape. Good, I thought yeah. that was probably a good call. I haven't decided whether or not to interline the skirt. But what they do traditionally, and I've done this because I used to do bridal wear alterations. They use the lining. The fabric is one. So you, you sew the line, you sew the fabric and you put them together. That way, when you do the hem, you get a blind hem. You just, but you have to hand sew the lining, tack it in all the way around. Mm-hmm. that's the plan Maria that's the plan 
and I've got the white petticoat, ordered that straight away. So that's ready to go. I have no idea where I'm going to wear this dress, probably just for tea, you know, sitting around having a cup of it. I'm very excited. So that, that's the next, the next sewing project. Yes. So leaps and bounds, you know, well, Angie, yes. leaps and bounds since we last spoke. <laughs> I know. It's crazy, isn't it? But it just makes me so happy. And I, I'm socialising now, which is lovely because, you know, we haven't been. And that's really, and I haven't been for even longer than the pandemic, as yeah. you know, yes. because my husband died. And I was in it and I was just saying to my friend, I just feel really excited about things. I walk around smiling and I, yes. I was thinking about that. Yeah. And I was thinking, it's been years since, literally years since I felt like this. And in some ways, it's, it's because of the pandemic, because it forced me out of this self-imposed isolation that I had. It forced me to get out and do things and find a way to socialise, if you like, or to, to occupy myself. Mm-hmm. And that led me to you and, and lots of lovely friends and people who comment on what I make. And, and that, it's just so nice. And I'm so grateful because, as I say, often as so is we don't get that. You just because you make these no. things and you don't tell anybody and... It is like, you know, when I was in town and there was a chap showing off his Porsche and his two mates around, oh, yeah, that's really great. Oh, what a car. And I was like, yeah, I've, I'm, I've got one better than that. I made this dress. Yes. <laughs> it just, it's a really, really good feeling. I love it. I'm in a really good place. I am. I'm in a good place. I know. <laughs> I just want to give you a hug. But if I was oh, there, bless I would. You. Oh, big hug. Yes, big hug. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Oh, I look cool. forward to hugs. A lot of our sewers are doctors and lawyers and, and policemen who come in when they're off to sew because it gives them something else to focus on. And I, mm. I get it. I totally get it, really. And, you know, and you hear about their lives and what they're doing and, and they're very matter of fact about it because it's what they do. And we're all like, wow, you're incredible. How do you do that? How do you keep going? And, and it's things like sewing that help to keep them going, I think, definitely. So if anybody's listening and you're thinking about sewing, do it now. You'll love it. It's great. Changed my life, Maria. I know. <laughs> I know. Honestly, I can see it in you yeah. from the yeah. first time we spoke to today. Well, can you? That's interesting. Oh, yeah. I've been well. looking forward to seeing you again and being able oh, to that's chat. So good. Absolutely. I'm so happy for you, Ange. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I am as well. Thank you. I'm happy for me. But yes, thank you. Yeah. It's, it's always so lovely to talk to you and so lovely to see your work. And it's it's really funny because I feel like I know. All these people in our little our little world, you know, Elaine. I, I got my my copy of Love Sewing the other day. Yeah. And opened it up. I thought, oh my God, there's Elaine. You know, then it's <laughs> like I know her, you know. Oh, my mate Elaine. <laughs> it's just and, it's, yeah. and somebody somebody did that to me. She was a friend, actually, who I used to work with when I did digital scrapbooking, a Facebook friend. She was another designer. And she said, I was watching Kirsty. And I said to my daughter, I know her, I know her. <laughs> And she said, I felt like Elf. It was just funny. That's what it's like, isn't it? It's it's so it's so lovely to connect with people, isn't it? I feel very lucky, actually, that I've I've got this craft that's led me to all these people. Really lucky. Angie, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. It was lovely again. Yes. Anytime you know that. Absolutely. You just ring me, girl. I'll be there. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. You take care, my lovely. Thank you. Thank you. All the best to you you and your family. And to you. See you soon. And have a lovely day, listeners. This episode of So Over 50 Podcast on Soul Organized Style was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Angie Hinksman, sound by bensound.com. You can subscribe to So Organized Style Podcast, but with an S, not a Z, on all good podcast apps. Make sure you give us a five star rating and review. And we hope you'll support us through our Patreon account to keep this podcast running. Make sure you go back and listen to the free library of So Over 50 podcasts we've now published. Post any questions or suggestions you have on our Instagram account at So Organized Style or on our website at www.soorganizedstyle.com or on our Facebook page. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>